let's just jump right in. I, I want to share some thoughts with you about the sacred and the silly as pathways to the joy of now. Beloved has just made such a fantastic move that the saint is now tripping over joy, bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. <laughs> Whereas, my dear, I'm afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. <laughs> so can you relate to that? I can relate to this so well. About 30 years ago, actually I'm going to count it off. It was 20... 29 years ago, just about right now, I got into a lot of trouble, literally overnight. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual trauma. It was kind of a mental illness, long story. We don't have time for it, but I, I was in a very, very deep state of, uh, state of despair and terror. And I was really afraid that I'd mess my life up forever and I would never get back to just being normal, whatever normal is. So uh, a low point, anybody had a low point? Yeah, so you know what that's like. You know how it motivates you. <laughs> you know how it motivates you to, to sort of uh, get, get better. I was looking at my life, trying to figure out what happened, how I got to be the way that I was, and come up with some kind of excuse. <laughs> and this is what I figured out. This is called, whoops. called Just a Little Soul Hanging Out in Space. This song has a lot of words. I really feel bad for this guy. <laughs> Well, I was just a little soul hanging out in space, getting ready to come into the human race. And God came over and he said to me, well, kid, what you want to be, now it's time for you to go get a life. You don't have to have no struggle or strife. You can live a life of comfort and ease, worldly pleasures. Do as you please. I can give you parents with Lots of money, Southern California, bright and sunny, tall and handsome, a movie star, fancy parties, expensive cars, or maybe an athlete with rhythm and grace. You could do the Olympics, win every race, confidence just oozing from you, and the women, they're going to love you. Or how about a yogi with mag No, no, no. Um, what's the next? Anybody remember how this goes? <laughs> Love you. Or maybe you'd like to help people in low places like uh, Mother Teresa. That's how it goes. But you know when it all said and done, being the Pope is a lot more fun. Or how about a yogi with magical powers? You could levitate for hours and hours and teach everybody to walk on hot coals, sell books and tapes by the truckload. But what do you say, kid? You make the call. You can have any party. You can have it all. If you just tell me what you want to be and I'll give it to you. It's my guarantee. Yeah. I just stood there with my mouth open Cause you know, that's just what I'd been hoping But while I was deciding to choose which one I thought, well maybe I'll just have me some fun Cause me and God, see, we're pretty tight And I know God likes a good joke alright So I figure I'll pull his leg for a while See if I can make the old boy smile so I say, Father of mine, you know, all that glory, to tell you the truth, sounds kind of boring. I want a life with some challenge to it. You know, something I gotta work to get through it. I don't want fame and easy success. I want to be shamed and easily depressed. With various physical and mental afflictions. 
Might as well throw in multiple addictions. I don't need life to be a sweet dream. I want writer's block and low self-esteem. Sensitive skin and food allergies. And when I get around girls, make me sneeze. Make me wish that I had more height. Give me claustrophobia, stage fright. Prone to worry, riddled with doubt. Thinking I'll never figure life out. Yeah, that's it, God. That's what I want to have. And then I just shut up so he could laugh. God looked at me with a puzzled brow, shook his head and just said, holy cow. For a minute he stood there pulling his beard and then he said, kid, you're pretty darn weird. And I know you're just playing the fool, but this time, kid, the joke's on you. And then he grinned at me and he yelled, shazam, that's my story. And here I am. Thank you. It sounds like some of you got here the same way. <laughs> Will Rogers said if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing is stop digging. That's right. And it's important that we have some awareness about what we think about all day because it does tend to manifest. But the good news about that is if we own that, if we take responsibility for our lives, then there's power there, right? There's hope there. Because if I'm the problem in my life, I'm also what? Problem in everyone else's life. <laughs> Let me ask you this, have you heard of a, a painter, an artist named Donald Roller Wilson? Got any Donald Roller Wilson fans here? <laughs> Nobody, no. <laughs> well, I haven't either, so don't feel bad. Um, I read about him in the airline magazine. Yeah, you know, it's amazing what you learn in the airline magazine. So this guy, he's, a, he's really quite a, an amazing painter. He's got a very, very cute sort of specific niche. All he paints, are these really gothic, realistic, highly detailed, uh, can you put that up, Larry? These pictures of animals dressed up in clothes <laughs> doing bizarre things. Like, <laughs> I think this one's playing with matches. Um, so this particular painting's, you know, about uh, eight and a half by 11, something along those lines, and it sells for like, I think, $30,000 worth. You know, he, he sells these to amazing amounts of money. So, you know, he's doing okay. Um, but what I loved about this was the article that went with the, the picture was uh, this quote that I have memorized because I love it so much. He says, let's see, how's this go? <laughs> he says, it takes all the arrogance out of everything you do when you know that God is so much bigger than you are. And yet, everything, you are and do and see is filled with God. The trees, the asphalt, the people fighting over Aquanet at Walmart. <laughs> that sounds silly, but silliness is just as important as love, just as important as tragedy. You can make a profound intellectual statement just by basing your efforts on silliness. Well, I agree completely. How many of you have how many of you have ever, uh, seen this uh, uh, Patch Adams movie with Robin Williams, Patch, uh, most of us? So, really funny movie. Uh, anybody had a chance to see the actual real Patch Adams? Anybody besides Danae? So, so the real Patch Adams is not like Robin Williams. He's six seven. he's a bean pole, he's got long gray hair down to mid-thigh, usually half dyed blue or purple. He's a doctor, medical doctor, who dresses like a clown. Wow, that was a good catch. 
So you don't, you don't think I planned that? <laughs> Woo! So, so, Got to get a new strap, I guess. But Anyway, Patch, he's a doctor. He dresses like a clown all day, every day. He's a clown doctor. And he's figured out the clowning, silliness. These are the ways that he can inflict love and compassion on everybody that he meets, the world in general. So that's what he does. He's almost finished building the first silly hospital <laughs> in the world. It's called the Gesundheit Institute. <laughs> it's free hospital. There's no fee for services. And everybody that works there is a volunteer, doctors, nurses, technicians, whatever. Lots of people waiting to volunteer at Gesundheit. Why? It's free. There's no payment. Well, it's fun. It's fun. So I've been around Patch quite a bit, and one of the things I've heard him say more than once is he feels like the world is wallowing in misery. And one of the most radical things you can do is to have a good day <laughs> and show it, you know, let everybody know you're having a good day. So that's not radical to us here in Unity, and we teach that. But let me ask you this. We all know that the world is serious, that life is serious. If we forget, we can turn on the news for two minutes and we get reminded real fast how serious life is. But is there anybody here besides me who's ever had the particular gift or talent of making life even more serious than it already is? <laughs> yeah. So, oh, I cut my thumb. No, it's all right. I like drinking blood. <laughs> I think it'll be fine. Just wipe it on my jeans. We'll auction these off later. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a song I wrote for myself about this whole too serious thing. Uh, so maybe you can relate to it. It's called Writer's Block with a long-term positive and negative effects of worry. I was worried about not writing any song. No words, no tunes, nothing for way too long. I was worried I'd never write again. Maybe there was no more ink in my pen. And I thought about that, and I began to feel ashamed. I was ashamed that I'd been worried about not writing. I've been through droughts before and come out fighting. It seemed like my worry was out of control, and I was ashamed about it down to my soul. And then it hit me what I was doing, and I started feeling guilty. I was guilty that I could let myself feel shame Over something so insignificant as this writing game I thought I'd released that stuff long ago And I felt guilty that I had such a long way to go Then I realized what I was doing And I felt embarrassed I was embarrassed that my shame could make me feel guilty. All these negative thought patterns, man, it was silly. If someone could see inside my head, they'd give me a drug and put me to bed. I was embarrassed, and that made me mad. I was angry that I could be so immature. I was angry at me, down on myself for sure. And as my anger turned into resentment, I thought about what the long-term effects of that man, and I realized what I was doing to my body, and I began to be afraid. I was afraid of what I was doing to myself. Negative emotions affecting my health. 
with body and mind are so interconnected. My shame, guilt, worry, and fear were making me infected. And I was afraid that I was becoming depressed. And as I began to sink into depression, the effect on my body and mind became an obsession. The outcome of this could not be in doubt And that gave me something new to worry about Knew that I might not be around for too long So I wrote it all down and I had a new song And when I thought about that, I was fine again I've never had a show where I had to drink my own blood. <laughs> a surgeon, we need a surgeon. Okay, there. Okay, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a little bit gross, I know. Okay, so that's a pretty silly song, but there's a lot of joy in that, see? In taking something limiting and troublesome and bothersome and restrictive and reframing it with humor. The charge is all gone. It's not such a big mountain to climb. So both those songs, you can see, those were reframing with humor. That's a handy thing to know how to do. Because worry is the enemy of joy, right? Yes. If, we're, if we're worried, are we living in this moment? No, where are we? Past, future, right. We're not here. The thing is, it's okay to look at the past and the future. Just don't stare. We get a lot of encouragement to do that from our culture. You know, this is why I say you have to pay attention to what you pay attention to, because there's so many things out there that really encourage us to do the wrong things. Why we come here, you know, to get reminded of the right things. Um, I heard Mel Brooks talking about this on TV. It was on 60 Minutes, and they, they, they interviewed him, and he said, you know, I, I read uh, that Socrates told us it's good to know thyself. He said, but I've learned it's way better to now thyself. <laughs> now thyself. He said, we need more people living in the now, living every day like this is our last day, which is why I never have clean clothes, because who wants to do laundry on the last day? <laughs> so silliness is a great way to now thyself. Silly, silliness is a great way to stop staring at the past and future and just come back to this moment, whatever this moment is. So, you know, I can talk to you about this all day, but here's a three second exercise that actually makes the point. And this is fun. It doesn't take any talent or preparation or practice or anything. All you have to do is when I say go, turn to somebody sitting close to you, next to you, whatever, and have a contest for three seconds to see who can make the weirdest face. <laughs> Ready, go. Get weird. Stretch those faces. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was so much fun, my neck cracked. <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm willing to bet that for those few seconds, nobody in here was thinking about their mortgage. <laughs> nobody was thinking about the test results or the divorce papers or whatever might be going on. You know, for those few seconds, we're just hearing that love and that fun, and that's all that existed. Every four-year-old knows this. We knew it when we were four. But we grow up, we have a lot of important stuff to do. 
or busy. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is where? Within. And to enter the kingdom of heaven must be like a child. Exactly. So simple. And we forget. We forget. Partly it's because we grow up in the United States, which is colonized to a great extent by the Puritans. Remember them? They were so serious, the English kicked them out. Yeah. H.L. Mencken said that a Puritan is somebody who's worried that somewhere, somehow, somebody might be having a good time. <laughs> so we all know where, where we come from. If we grow up in the U.S., we have some of that cultural Puritan DNA because that's this country, and it means we can work hard. We work harder than anybody in the world still. It's that lightening up that sometimes we have trouble with. And so if you grow up serious like I did, I mean, my mom told me I was the most serious little kid she'd ever seen. And I, I, that was in my 20s when she said that. I didn't want to... <laughs> she's telling me, she said, when you were little, you were the most serious little kid I'd ever seen. I, I didn't want to say, well, you know, might have been better if you weren't drinking all the time. But uh, I didn't. The point is, we grow up serious. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it's OK to practice and be good at being in the moment. And silliness is such a great way to do it. Now, people ask me all the time, they say, you know, Greg, OK, I get it. I want to be better at this. How do I start? And what I like to say, because this is what's helped me a lot, is try, here's a sort of an exercise that a lot of situational comedy is based on. Try not to give a serious answer to any question that doesn't absolutely require it. You'll find that it's way, way, way more acceptable than you think. <laughs> but it takes a little practice if you're not used to, it, to doing it. So people say, OK, great, well, well how, do I, uh, how do I do that? Well, here's the easiest way to start. What's the one question you get asked all day long? <laughs> how are you doing? Usually we say fine or good or whatever. You know, all right. And what if instead of that, you say, how you doing? Well, I'm still getting away with it. <laughs> how you doing? Parts of me are excellent. <laughs> how you doing? Well, I feel a lot more like I do now than I did a while ago. How are you doing? What's yours, David? Approaching perfection. Approaching perfection. <laughs> so this is, this is one. We have three sections in this humor workshop that we're going to cover today. This is one of them. There's a section about how to have more fun on your own, how to retrain your brain to have a humor outlook in life, because you can do that. Uh, I did it. And I'm going to show you how that works. It's a lot of fun. And then we're going to, part two is, is kind of this. We're going to have, talk about how to have more fun with other people all day long. And then part three is kind of a surprise, because that's, you know, I don't want to scare anybody off. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really funny. Part three is really funny. So um, let's give you an example of how this can work. I got on a Southwest Airlines flight, and you know, you board on Southwest, you board through the galley, and there's usually a flight attendant there that says, hi, welcome aboard. And so I got on. She says, hi, welcome to Southwest. Uh, how you doing? I said, I'm hungry. <laughs> steak and lobster for lunch? And she laughed, and she said, yeah, sure. How do you like your steak? I said, rare. She said, good, because any steak on this airline would be extremely rare. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well done. <laughs> so you're not always going to hit a home run like that. Sometimes people are going to look at you like you're the weirdest person in the world. 
but it's okay, you tried, you know, you, you've made an effort. And sometimes it pays off in, in really fun, big ways and changes everybody's day. You know, that's what we're going for. So, uh, so anyway, silliness is a great way to know thyself. I, I believe that. I believe all of the, the gifts that we come to God for are available in every moment. All the love and the beauty and the power and the healing and the, and the comfort and joy and all of it, the grace, everything's available all the time. We just forget how to be in the moment. So we need to come back more often, be in the flow. Silliness is one good way. There are other ways. You know about meditation. You know about uh, heart math we did this morning for the first service. You know about prayer. You know about uh, group singing. You know about um, um, powerful feelings of love and connection, uh, service. What? Dancing. Okay, let's just stop right now. <laughs> Start dancing. So, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, very good. Thank you for that. I want to touch on, I'm going to skip over dancing just for a little bit. I'm going to touch on the idea of the sacred, and I'm talking about the mystical connotation of this word sacred. Uh, one of the things I did when I, I got in so much trouble, I got down in that uh, despair, that pit, that black hole, and I was so afraid I was never going to, just be able to have a good day again, was I went back to reading mystics. I had gotten away from that for a long time, and I rediscovered descriptions of the mystical experience of joining with God. So we're talking about mystics that join with God so completely that there's nothing else but God. There's no experience of the individual self left. It's been surrendered. Everything is God. If you ever read Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger, there's a story in there about watching a mother feed her milk to a baby. And he says it was like watching God pour God into God. You know, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Well, it really helped me because I figured if it was possible for humans to live at that level, then it had to be possible for me to get up out of my despair and feel good again. So what I want to do with the last little few minutes is create an experience where we meditate, chant, sing, pray together as a group and create a little experience where we move down that path a bit, right? Okay, cool. So we're going to use a, a chant that you know, most of you, called Heart of the Mother. Uh, people think I wrote it because I recorded it. I did not write it. It's by Michael Stillwater, and Michael is an amazing composer, so he gets all the credit, deservedly so, because this is a powerful, really transformative little piece of music. Uh, amazing for how simple it is and how much it can do. I am one with the heart of the mother. I am one with the heart. who have hurt you and those who have offended you but forgive yourself for what you have done and for that which you have failed to do that which is done there is no need to speak of that which is past there is no need to blame 
have self-control, self-knowledge, self-respect, and the courage to dare. Be tranquil. The light of intelligence will shine. And strive to make a spot where you stand beautiful. Then the beauty and harmony will follow you in all your ways and in all your days. On this journey, we call life.